From Pee-wee to Dumbo and everything in between, join us every Thursday in April for Filmography Tim Burton. Our five-part season will break down all 19 of Burton's feature-length films to date in detail. Follow Filmography on Spotify or wherever else you find your podcasts. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. If you're already a subscriber, thanks. Thanks for uh, checking this uh, series out uh, every single week. But if you're not a subscriber and maybe it's your first time listening, please do take a moment to, uh, to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening from right now. Of course, that includes anywhere you get your favorite podcasts from, like iTunes and Apple Podcasts, but you can also subscribe on YouTube and on Spotify. And hey, if you're just looking to reach out to me, uh, Twitter at Kyle Meredith or Facebook slash Kyle Meredith, which serves as an intro. That's me. I am Kyle Meredith. And- and today, my guest is Perry Farrell, the lead singer of Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros, has a brand new solo record on the way called Kind Heaven, which is actually a title that stands for a lot of things in his life right now, a building, an immersive show, and so much more that he's going to tell us about. It's a concept record, and he'll tell us about how it ties in with the return of the Messiah and what that would be like with today's current political system. He wrote a song for Rachel Maddow. We'll get the story on that as well as which members of Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros are featured on the record. And beyond that, there's a really epic idea of how he mixed this record. I am in creative. I'll plant that seed right now. You've got to hear him talk about it and explain that as well. He's one of my all-time favorite artists and one of rock's most important minds. It's Kyle Meredith with Perry Farrell. Hi, Kyle. Well, let's start out here. I mean... What directed you to do the solo album? Was it, was it ever a thought that this was either going to be a, a Jane's or a, or a Porno for Pyro's record, or did, was this always going to be the next Perry solo record? Well, in all honesty, uh, I, began, I began to formulate ideas for Kind Heaven while I was uh, active in Jane's Addiction. Wanted to work with them on it. Ended up to mainly work with Chris Cheney, the bassist, Chris ended up recording every every song with me, and I still have a hope that perhaps the next uh, Kind Heaven uh, recording will include more players. Uh, you know, we, we're a family and we'll always be a family, but I started to go off on this musical journey, and then it became a... Uh, a spiritual journey by myself and, you know, didn't have time necessarily to slow down. I was, because of my connections with the the musicians, the contemporary musicians around the world with Lollapalooza, I befriended uh, people like Cascade, who's a house producer, uh, Joachim Guerrero, house producer, Bob from Bloody Beetroots. My friend Harry Gregson Williams is a uh, a film composer and an orchestra conductor. So my, my collection of musicians were the people that I, I collaborated with in this case. And I was able to get Pete Stefano from Porno for Pyros in on a couple of tracks. He plays uh, lead on, I think, three tracks. And, and it's, it's really fun because... I'm looking at it as an orchestra where people can come in and, you know, come and go. If there's a, a tour to be, ha- you know, to be had and my certain players are available, we can all get together and go out on a tour and have some fun and, and make some music. And if somebody else is not available, you know, they just, uh, their position is filled by another family member. And so, we're just kind of building this great orchestra that is part of this beautiful project that uh, that speaks about and tells the story of the life on the threshold of the Messianic era. Now, what is it exactly of that right there, the Messianic era? Well, it is it is the time when uh, the the Messiah would return to Earth. So. Obviously, it hasn't happened yet. We all await the return of the Messiah. 
well, what if the Messiah returned today? So, <laughs> you know, that that becomes very interesting. It's a very interesting picture that I've got in my mind. If the Messiah were to return today, what with uh, the the um, problems that we're having around the world with the with the autocratic strongmen that are leading nations, and uh, I don't know, there's the technology is is uh, in place now where we can spread message. I mean, Messiah really means messenger, right? Mm -hmm. So I see this time. As the mess, I really truly do see this time as the messianic era that we're entering. Uh, it began essentially in 1991 with the beginning of the world, you know, the creation of the World Wide Web, the internet. And so now we can spread a message anytime, anywhere, to anyone. That's never happened in, you know, in man's history. It's happening now. So I just then went forward and began to think of different scenarios. What would happen if the Messiah were living now? He might be watched by the CIA. He might be on somebody's enemies list that doesn't want a Messiah around. You know, the Antichrist could be a, a president of a country, right, that doesn't want the message that the Messiah is spreading. That would be one of peace or or at least contrary to what the, the autocratic strongman's message is. So I was having a lot of fun thinking of all these wild scenarios. What would really happen if the Messiah were to be alive today? Yeah. And that's the premise of the of the of kind heaven. It's, it's really interesting because within that, I'm going to guess a lot of those scenarios do kind of cross over with current day politics in, in that it. Uh, you know, I know, I know you. You know, up until I think recently, when you tweeted, like you know, news has been a big part of your day as much as it's been a part of every one of our days. So to kind of hear those scenarios, it's uh, it's it's interesting how they might play out in the way you're talking about them. Yeah. So as an example, um, the the album opens with the song "Red, White, and Blue Cheerfulness," and it was essentially written about the modern uh, newscaster. Uh, it, in my mind, I don't know uh, what what news you watch, but my favorite is Rachel Maddow. Oh, yeah. I love watching Rachel into Lawrence O'Donnell. And, um, but Rachel has got a, a very fresh and intelligent way of explaining the news. She's, she stays in a good mood. It's a, a, kind of a red, white, and blue cheerfulness is what I call it. So I should tell you that the, the songs go with the story. They do tell a story, mm -hmm. and the story comes to life in a location uh, in Las Vegas, a, bu a building that we have right across the street from Caesar's Palace. We've rented for the last next 10 years, I have a lease, wow. for a 100,000-square-foot building. Uh, it's going to be called Kind Heaven. And it's five floors, and I've gutted the, it was a hotel previously, and now it's going to be an immersive entertainment complex, meaning that it's going to be all entertainment, dining, adult entertainment, dancing, uh, retail, and, and immersive improvisational actors and comedians, uh, dancers, parkour, martial artists. So you're going to be entertained in a way that you've never been entertained before. I'm trying to create a new scene. I, I think I think we're a little we're all a little tired of bottle service. That's the last great uh, you know addition to the to the music scene is bottle service, and I just don't think bottle service can last much longer. We need something else, you know. So the idea of just you know uh, doing the album. I mean, the album sounds like it's only one small part of a very big idea. I mean, the words kind heaven means a lot in, in your life right now. Yeah. So the, re the reason it's called kind heaven is I started to study aspects of the Messiah and the messianic era. You know, there's not a lot of information that that I knew of, of when I started. I'm sure you probably don't 
have much to report about the Messiah and the Messianic era. I mean, most people would say, well, it's when Jesus returns. Okay, well, maybe it is. So let's put that in the hat. That's one thing that can certainly happen. But if it, but if it were true, uh, if, if Jesus returned right now, what would happen to him? You know, he would be under surveillance, just like we all are. So surveillance plays a big part of the story. Drugs plays a big part of the story. Music plays a big part of the story. An antichrist figure. But those are the those are the kind of the vices that are on earth. Um, I'm going to tell you something that you might not have heard before. But what's also supposed to happen, though, is heaven is supposed to come down and live on earth. So God returns to earth, lives amongst us, and then peace ensues from there. So there's peace on earth, peace for some say a thousand years and some some people that I, uh, I ask say peace forever. So how do we get from where we are right now currently to peace on earth? That is the story of kind heaven. Yeah. And, and it ends with a song called Let's All Pray for This World. Exactly. So my idea is that, listen, we all uh, the, all of us who claim to love God and be, believe have the faith in God, we, uh, you know, for the most part, I think mankind, they're, they're good people. I would say, though, that I'm using this as a, an average. I would say approximately 30 percent of any of any race, denomination, religious background, 30 percent of the people are, don't quite get it yet, and they're either faking it or they're not good at it at being uh, a, a good person or a good human being, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it's the same amount. Yeah, I would say approximately 30%. 70% of, of your own race, but there's a good there, – there's maybe 30% of, of the Caucasians that screw up. You hear, like, something bad happens. You're just praying it's not <laughs> – it's not one of yours. You know, it's not one of your race that did it, right? Everybody's that way. Like, really? They went and shot all these people? Okay, what was he? You know, that's the first question. That's the next question they ask. Like, what was he? Oh, no. Oh, shit. And then, it's, then you're embarrassed, you know, for your race. Well, you shouldn't be because everybody has got mostly good people in their race, and then they've got these people that they're embarrassed about. So, yeah, so let's all pray together. Let's all pray for this world. I think that one of the things that can really help to affect this change where uh, heaven comes down to earth and war ends, in other words, the soldiers study war no more, they drop their spears and they pick up the plowshare. In other words, they don't, they don't use man's inventions of, uh, of destruction turn into ways to feed the world. So one one thing that we could do, since we, for most of us, you know, believe in, in a God and believe in a spirit world, uh, kind of heaven also, spe- you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion about angels and um, celestial camps, basically the other side, the other side, the other world. Why don't we we're good people. We believe in the same God, right? We all come from the same God. We're the children of this God. Why don't we pray together for the, to this God? Why is it that we have to go in a corner and be and be in our own building? That you know, it, it doesn't see, it doesn't make sense to me that we have to. That's got to be the process. It makes more sense to me that we would get together and make music together. That, to me, is a vision of peace. So how I'm writing the story is the way it all happens is it it happens when the world starts to make music together. And music is, you know, it's a form of meditation and it's a form of prayer. I want to switch gears just for a second. I read something about the sound mix being something really different and interesting for this record, too. I am in creative. What, what, what is that, and how does it set it apart from, from what we've heard in the past? Okay. Well, 
So because I have this structure in Las Vegas, I have to figure uh, how to, I have to figure my sound system differently because previously I look at sound systems, especially in, in, uh, in the live sense. So you have a stage and then you've got speakers pointing out at an audience. And maybe you've got a group uh, on a very rare occasion like, like a Roger Waters Pink Floyd that will do quadraphonic sound. So the world began with mono sound. One one speaker went to stereo, then went to quadraphonic. And where we are today, technologically with sound is, it's called Atmos. The number is 7.1. So you can start with an array of speakers as that will surround the room. It has to be calibrated. The, the speakers have to be separated at a certain distance. But basically, the software allows you to fly sounds around the room. So it could be a bee. You could be simulating the sound of a bee. And that B could be annoying and bothering everybody within the field of sound that you've set up. They are doing it today in movie theaters. So when you go to a movie theater, the, that great experience of the explosion that comes from behind you and the footsteps that are to the side, the girl screaming or um, the seagull flying overhead, all that is created with the software that is called Atmos. Uh, you know, atmosphere, mm -hmm. atmos. Mm -hmm. So ours is the first album ever to be uh, mixed in atmos. So how I did it was, and this, and this all came to me because I had to consider the sound that people would be uh, experiencing in Las Vegas in this building. It couldn't. It's not a flat screen. You're not walking into a building and just sitting down and looking at a, a stage or a screen, you're walking all over the place. So I started to strategize away. Well, if that's the case, we could do really special things like whispers that are coming and fo we can focus at most uh, sound as well to whisper into a person's ear that only you would hear the message. And we can really have fun with sound and it could be a really unique and new experience if we mix in Atmos. So then I thought, well, I want to take that experience out into the fields of Lollapalooza or on tour with me, which I have the ability to do. So now the shortcomings of this amazing new technology and experience in, in sound the shortcomings are that nobody else has done it before, so there are not rooms yet. There's really literally two rooms in America. One of them is in Chicago, and the other is in San Francisco, that is set up to receive Atmos mixes. But, you know, you can take it from me in the next five years, everybody's going to be thinking about how to use this amazing new software to everything, you know, to mix. You'll be able to hear Atmos mixes in cars, home entertainment centers. I know for a fact that the speaker industry because Atmos, uh, they work with Dolby Sound for the movies, movie theaters, and they use Harman Kardon, but they're not going to be the only ones. All the speaker companies are now thinking of how to set up Atmos Sound in, in homes, and they're, and they're doing it. So in the next you know, two years, three years, the speakers will have the ability to play Atmos recorded uh, music. And so, and I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's complicated, but I hope I'm explaining it. Oh, perfectly. Uh, so understand. Okay, great. Yeah. So there's a, one other element to it, and it is the, the term binaural. Uh -huh. So binaural, basically, I've recorded and mixed the album in, yes, stereo, so that every system that exists today can play it. I, it's recorded and mixed in Atmos. So if you happen to have a situation like Dolby Studio, a movie theater, an incredible home entertainment theater, you can hear the songs in surround. And also, I've recorded them binaurally, which means if you have headphones, you can get the experience of surround sound wearing headphones. You know, um, 
And producer Chad Blake, I know he he kind of specialized in that. A lot of producers have used binaural over the years, but it's always interesting when you see the studio picture and there's that head, because that mannequin head a lot of people use in the studio to kind of capture that as if you were in the room. It's it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's, that's the one. I can't wait to hear, somehow hear, how all that will sound a, as you envision it, too. And, and Perry, uh, again, congratulations on, on Kind Heaven. That, that first single, Pirate Punk Politician is instantly one of my favorite songs that you've ever done. I loved it from the start, and I wow. really appreciate it. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, that's great. Perry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. It has really been an honor, and, uh, and again, uh, congratulations on everything that Kind Heaven is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. All right, I look forward to meeting you one day. All right, man, take care. Take care. Bye. A huge thanks to Perry Farrell. Again, the new solo record is called Kind Heaven, as well as everything else that Kind Heaven means in his life right now. Hey, before you get out of here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Would love for you to keep up. We put out interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Consequence of Sound. Of course, you can subscribe on uh, iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Acast, or Podchaser. You can also follow along on YouTube or Spotify if that's your speed. And after that, head to WFPK.org where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern. You can also find some bonus episodes of this series, consequenceofsound.net. They've got your music and film news. And again, you can find me at Twitter, at Kyle Meredith, and Facebook, slash Kyle Meredith. Does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.